Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. He has written more than four dozen best-selling books for kids and adults. You probably know him best from his wildly successful Kingdom Keepers and Peter and the Star Catchers series. He is a notorious workaholic and is well known for the extensive research he undertakes for each project. He joins us tonight to discuss the craft of storytelling and his latest book, The Return. Book one, the Disneylands, or Return to the Disneylands, right? Or Return Disneylands. Disneyland. I got it right. I'll get it eventually. Uh, we will also launch tonight a new literacy initiative, Storyented, and he's going to help me. Please welcome New York Times best-selling author Ridley Pearson. Ridley, Thank you, Raymond. what an honor to have it's you appreciate here. appreciate to be here. My, my family, particularly my boys, are rabid Kingdom Keepers fans. Well, you better and lock them up. That means there's something wrong. Well, with them. you know, and... and I'm so glad for we, that. Well, we go to the Disney parks, and the first time we saw the very first Kingdom Keepers book, it was there at the Disney parks, and they've kept reading every one of them. How many do you have now? This is uh, eight? Yeah, this is eight, and I've just finished nine. Wow. Yeah. Okay, we're going to get into that whole series, but I want to back up a little bit. I want to talk about you, your family. You come from a musical and literary family, both your mom and dad. Yeah, I do. Um, I, there was a lot of creativity, and you know, when you're when you're talking to middle schools, as we both do, yeah. uh, you get the question of sort of how did you get into this? And it dawned on me that my my grandfather on my mother's side, if you can believe this, was born in 1864, wow. I think, or 1883. I'm sorry, 1883, and he uh, strung telegraph wire across the West. So he had stories. He would literally sit me on his knee and tell stories about living with Native Americans mm. uh, back in the early 1900s. And I'm sure he made it all up. But it w they were great they were stories. Oh, my gosh. And my paternal grandfather uh -huh. um, was one of these guys who could memorize long-form poetry. So he would sit you on his lap in a different visit and recite Charge of the Light Brigade or one of these, you know, 90-minute oh. poems. Mm. And so I think this oral storytelling, d despite that my father was a writer, my mom was a fine, mm -hmm. fine artist, this, this idea of sort of always telling story got in me from in a very little, very little boy, oh. very, very young age. But then you're in college, and then you leave college. Yeah. You go off to be a musician. Yeah, I went off to try to be James Taylor. How did uh, that work out? Yeah, well, yeah. you but you toured for a while. What I was did, it, yeah, like 11, six years, no, seven years, years, more than yeah. that? And I wrote about 300 songs. Um, uh, and, and how does that, how did the music writing and performing shape and help you today? It's, uh, I don't think, there are two big pieces that I think helped me be a writer. One is I went to a boarding school called Pomfret School. And um, it taught me, you know, you learn all these things in high school and all of that. But it taught me how to study. Mm. And it taught me self-discipline. Um, so, so that was just gigantic. And, and you, in a band, you learn that when you turn your song over to these four or five other guys, mm. and I would write, I, I score, so I, we had a flute and cellos and all these things. Boy. And I would put all that in front of everybody, and it would sound just great. And then about three months into touring it, I would go, well, that's not the stuff I wrote, and it sounded really good. <laughs> and I realized that role of collaborative effort, mm. which is what The Kingdom Keepers is about. It's yeah. Yeah. five kids collaboratively trying to solve puzzles and defeat these people who want to take over the Disney Kingdom. The, the overtakers, and we'll get into those momentarily. Um, you write for eight and a half years before you're ever published. Yeah, yeah, that was that whole How music. did you keep that? You were touring at the time, and you were writing? Was, I was playing a lot of music at the time, and I was writing about six hours a day, seven days a week. Oh, my god! I wrote 11 screenplays for television, teleplays in those days. None of them sold. Um, I and what kept you going? Three, oh, I just love telling stories. You know, I think, oh. I think if you... You know, there's, you can't really teach writing. You can teach better writing, mm -hmm. but you have to. You've got the bug. You know, mm -hmm. you've got to. You're afflicted. Gotta get, <laughs> yeah, you're afflicted. Something's got to get you up at six in the morning behind the chair, other than a paycheck or this or that. You mm -hmm. want to do it, right? You, you have to. And share I've just this. always loved doing it. I was the guy in middle school who would tell all the fiction to matchmake. I'd say, you know, Tommy really has a crush on you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And the girl would go, really? Really? And, you know, Tommy had no idea who this person was. You just wanted to see the I clash. I just wanted to make it happen. Watch yeah. the drama. I yeah. love it. Uh, tell me about Lou Bolt, who is 
your protagonist he in is. a number of thrillers. He is you, in... you wrote thrillers initially. Yeah, and still do. Yep. Um, I wrote uh, police procedurals uh, with Lou Bolt and a character named Daphne Matthews. Yeah. And, you know, they early on when you're writing, as you know, they say write what you know or what right. you love. But you didn't and know policing, No, did I didn't, but I loved reading those kinds of books. Uh -huh. And so I um, devoted myself to really study. And I do a ton of research still for all these books yeah. and because it's the really fun part. You say and you put point. fact into fiction. Yeah. And, and Lou Bolt came out of my imagination. Mm -hmm. And then three and a half years, four years into writing him, I met him. A, a guy, a, a cop walks I in had, and you well, I, Yeah, I had heard about this guy, Don Cameron, on the Seattle Police Force. And this prosecuting attorney had used one of my books to help solve a crime. A murder. And he said, "Is there any, if there's ever anything I can do for And I said, stop. Can you get me a sit down with Don Cameron? I'd tried to get this probably six times. And he said, I bet I can. And so Don Cameron saw me. He, he interviewed me in the interrogation room <laughs> instead of his office. <laughs> and, and so I swing this door open, and it was Lou Bolt. It was uh, the very character. It looks like the character and comes I to talked life. to him for like 90 minutes, and I said, I'm sorry if I'm tripping all over myself, but you are Lou Bolt. And, and he's a very slash mouth guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this little grin comes on. He goes, Ridley, I know I'm Lou Bolt. I've read all the books. <laughs> oh you know, so gosh. it was a marriage made in heaven. I love it. it. You, that, you, you talked a moment ago about the research you do, and you do extensive research, even for these uh, Kingdom even, Keepers yeah, books, which we'll get into books. in a moment. Yeah. Um, you were researching a book called The First Victim and then The Pied Piper, mm. and it led you to a special little girl. It did. Tell me about it led that. led us to Story Pearson. Um, Your daughter. I, yeah, my wife and I had both talked about how we love adoption, uh, when we were courting, huh. and then I wrote, I wrote those two books, and um, it was during Pied Piper, which is about um, some people sneaking into the country in a container ship, which doesn't seem novel anymore, but back then it had only happened once that anybody knew of. And on my desk, which was the dining room table at the time, she saw a statistic that 30,000 little girls in China were moved into orphanages every year mm. and about 2,000 got out to adoption. And she said, remember when we talked about adoption? This is, this is where our next child comes from. And, uh, and so, so now we have a junior in high school who's been mm. with us since she was four and a half months old as the, the light of our lives along with Paige. And uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been just a terrific, terrific working out. And, and one of your daughters was responsible for Peter and the Star Catchers, which people know now not only from the books and the yes. series, but the Broadway but a play. play, which yeah, I saw, a beautiful play, so and it's now it's, it's toured the country. It's yeah. been everywhere. Yeah, yeah. What was the, the, the germ of well, this Well, you know idea? how, as writers, we're always looking for ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, like you, I'm sure I have an abundance of ideas, but I'm always observant. I always try to keep my ears and eyes open. I tell, tell kids this, you know, that if you want to be a writer, keep your ears and eyes open. And I was reading to my then five-year-old daughter, who's now 18 and a student mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and um, she said to me, we were reading Peter Pan, and she said to me, how did Peter meet Captain Hook? Huh. And I said, well, I'll be darned. How come Peter can fly? Why did he never grow old? And mm -hmm. all the prequel ideas flooded into me, where did he meet Captain Hook? Oh, wow. Tinkerbell, where'd she come from, on and on and on. And uh, I play in a rock and roll band with a whole bunch of crazy authors, including Dave Barry. And Stephen and King Stephen and Amy King, Tan. Amy Tan, Scott Turow, Mitch Album. Uh, and I was staying at Dave's house to play one of these shows and mentioned this to Dave, and his eyes kind of went wide. And I said, you know, I'm thinking about writing this prequel, and I kill people for a living in my murder <laughs> mysteries, and you write booger jokes. And you know, could perhaps we, we could work could we together. Make something that was suspenseful but funny, and do it together. And or a murderous booger. The table and the said, two. "I'm in." Yeah, I so, love it. And that was it. That was it. And you all did multiple books. We, we ended in up two writing series. ten books together. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, then the Kingdom Keepers comes along. Yes. Where did this originate? And tell me about. Have you ever been to the Disney parks? Where is that? Where, down where are those? Orlando, Florida. Oh, I think I might have gone there once or twice. So I went there once as a only one time. Some year old, oh, never my. had been. What? I grew up to the wonderful world of color. I was Disney everything, but I'd never been to the park. Yeah, I grew up in New Orleans, and um, we would make the pilgrimage sometimes oh, twice a year. Well, it's worth going five times. Well, a year. but I went for the first time in my 40s with our kids, oh. and with Dave Barry, oh, um, and his family. 
And after the fireworks, you walk out. Right. There's 80,000 of you leaving the park. Mm -hmm. And I looked around, and that day, I, I know we've shared some photos. I had also met Mickey Mouse oh. and some of the princesses <laughs> um, and really just had the most special day. Oh. And none of the characters were leaving the park. And I had what I call my Toy Story moment, you know, when Andy's door shuts and the toys come alive. Mm -hmm. I thought, so what does happen for these next nine hours when no one's here? Huh. And, and I just could picture Mickey and people peering around their doors going, have they the, left yet? <laughs> is the coast you know? clear? Yeah. And then what's that world? And that became the kingdom. Mm. And where did the overtakers come from? These are the villains. The overtakers came from Walt Disney's unbelievable creative imagination and the fact that he borrowed from the Brothers Grimm some terrific dark characters, mm -hmm. and they either get slapstick time or they get very little time at all in the animated features. Right. And it bugged me because he had really good, dark, deep characters Villains, yeah. that weren't getting used. And I thought they would be upset about this. You know, like, <laughs> why are we always made fun of? And why is this park so fun? Why can't it be mean and scary? Mm -hmm. And that they would want to take the park over, mm -hmm. get rid of all these stupid little fluffy characters, <laughs> and it would be Maleficent's park. So There is a redemptive edge in these books there that is. I've seen. And my boys have read them, my little girls reading them now. Um, th there is a strong sense of good versus evil, right. justice. Your thrillers are marked by that same sensibility. Are you aware of that? I am very aware of that, yeah, and I believe in that. Tell me, I, I, was, I was impressed to come across something. You, you said in an interview, you read the Bible every day. I do. Why? And how does it affect your wife? <coughs> Excuse me. My wife introduced me to that idea. You know, not only a little prayer to get you started in the day, mm -hmm. but to read the Bible, and they're the greatest stories that are there, for one thing. Yeah, and they, and, and, and that they're grounding. the basis of every story that we read, really. Yeah. And um, amazing characters, and the Christ's life is, is so beginning, middle, and end, mm -hmm. and it's the way all drama has been shaped since the Greeks, is beginning, yeah. middle, and end, yeah. with including a resurrection piece at the end. Yeah. Um, so it's, it doesn't hurt, you know, to rub, rub up against the greats. That's, yeah. that's, and, 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 and that one's pretty great. And, you know, on a spiritual side, it just, it's, it's instructive and calming and soothing. And uh, I think um, it, it, you know, although I get teased about it by some of my friends, it's, um, it works for me. I'm not saying it's for everybody. Yeah. It just works for yeah. me. Tell me, uh, because I, I, when I read that, I thought people don't realize. People, people see these books. And they say, wow, this, this must be great to, to, to be an author. To... They don't realize when, and, it, and it, there, is, there is something great sure. about it. And it's wondrous and wonderful that you can share a piece of your own heart and understanding and, and let someone else go on that journey and find their own way through it. There is also, you and I know, when you're sitting at that desk alone, watching other people live life or hearing about it, there is a heavy cost to it. And you're carrying all these worlds and people around in your head that no one else has access to until it's published. Yeah. Does it help you cope with that? Does the spirit I'm sure it does. Yeah, I'm sure it sort does. of help you Yeah, just get like singing that. a hymn does. I mean, uh -huh. it, you know, it frees up your, it gets you focused on something else. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, because I write multiple books, um, How many a, do you do a year? I'm doing three right now. But, simultaneously? You know, simultaneously. Um, and during the Dave Barry years, it was two and a half, which <sighs> made me think I might be able to do three, and I think it was a mistake. But, oh you God. know, you've got a lot of stories and a lot of characters, and just a lot going on in your head. Mm -hmm. Everybody does. I mean, yeah. I'm not claiming it's harder work than anything else, but um, it's busy up there. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's nice to still that and find a quiet place. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to bring some of those ideas into the work. Yeah. One of the early parts of the Kingdom Keepers is that these kids are actually holograms in the park. Right. That's how I worked it out with Disney attorneys to allow me to wreak havoc in their park. <laughs> but DHI technology. DHI, yeah, daylight hologram imaging. Or but Disney host interactive. True. Boy, you have read this, well, Raymond. I, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm there. I'm so there's, there's a piece of it early on, and I carry it through the whole deal, which is that these, these kids are holograms, uh -huh. but that if they allow fear into themselves, they begin to get solid. They begin to lose that hologram, and they are very vulnerable at that point. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the other answer to your Bible thing, is I think the more we can keep fear out of our lives, mm -hmm. um, you know, the more 
the, the easier our lives are than when we let fear in. Before we go to break, um, George R. R. Martin says uh, all writers are either architects or gardeners. <laughs> I you, love <laughs> that. Which are you? Do you build I am an architect. outliner? You're oh, an architect. Boy. You build the am whole I an outline. Architect. I build the outline. It takes months. I build the characters, the character arcs. Oh. I go and do all this research mm -hmm. because I think the more fact I can put in my fiction, the more I can suspend your disbelief, which is my role, uh -huh. is to, if you start thinking, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, the book goes it's right out. across the room. Mm -hmm. so, do, you, do, you, do you write bios of all the characters? I do. I write bios and little Bibles and what food they like and all these things that will never show up in the book. Mm -hmm. But I know but them. But you know them. Yeah. And it fleshes them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. We will leave it there for a moment. Now, look, if you have a question for Ridley, you can call in now, 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S., one 800 221 9460 or internationally 205-271-2980 on email world over at ewtn.com or you can tweet me at Raymond Arroyo in a moment I'll introduce a new literacy program it's called story oriented and Ridley will take your calls and emails the world over live continues in a moment stay right there <laughs> Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. I'm joined once again in D.C. by best-selling author Ridley Pearson. We're launching a new literacy initiative tonight. It's called Storyented, because I believe stories orient our lives and help us find our place in the world. Now, our catchphrase is, find your story, find your way. The idea is to bring authors and readers together, sort of an international book club each month. If you go to storyented.com, you can discover more. We've got some literacy tips, some recommended books, and much more. Uh, I have some questions for you, Ridley. They're already coming in. We all in. have great stories, don't we? we? Well, and that's what, and it's not only those Isn't of us who incredible? write them. Oh, no. As you talked about your grandfather. It's everybody. We all have stories, and we have to share. It's so important that you share them with I, kids. I mean, I can think of, you know, one afternoon when I was 12 years old. It's its own book, you know? I mean, uh, we all all have those stories. We have a Fabulous. phone call. You want to go to a phone call? Are you there? Go ahead. Who's calling? George from D.C. You're on the world over. What's your question? Hello. Um, so what go was ahead, it George. like? What was it like to spend the night in in Disneyland and doing research on your book? Ah, good ah, so question, George. George knows something about this. You have a reader. Yes. Yeah, so my my one requirement when Disney and I discussed doing these books mm -hmm. was that I would need full access to their theme parks, and they said we don't give that. And I said, okay, but that's from my crime writing. That's how I do things. Mm. And they called me back about a month later and said, we're, we've got a VIP pass for you. You can go into any park around the world for free. And if you call ahead, we will assign a Disney Imagineer, the people who design the parks. Right to be your guide and you can go in any hour you want. To any um, attraction you want? Anything I wanted to do. In, in basically in the dark, as George said, in Disneyland wow. or Disney World in this case. Yeah. For the first several years it was Disney World. So one of the first places I went to was It's a Small World. Wow. But it was a very different It's a Small World. It was 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the park is creepy. You know, the most magical place on earth. It's so perfect. Yeah. that when no one's in it, it is a scary ghost town. Wow. And we walked over and we got to uh, Small World and went in. It was dark in there, only emergency lighting, no music. All the dolls are, oh. you know, stuck in their little place. And uh, two of the dolls moved. And I just jumped out of the boat I was in. <laughs> oh, and you they, took the rock. Yeah, You're yeah, in the rock. I mean, you know, it's dead quiet. We're sloshing yeah. around because I wanted to see what it's like when yeah. it's creepy. And But two of the dolls moved. And, and I was... <laughs> <laughs> and the guy next to me said, what's wrong with you? I said, two of the dogs just moved. And I ended up putting that into the book because that's the stuff you can't make up. Uh, and Raymond, two of the dolls moved. I'm, I'm not being facetious uh, here. Two of the no, dolls moved. It's, and that's one of the creepier scenes you know. in, the, in, the, yeah, in the book. Well, yeah, well, I still can't go in there. Richard from Los Angeles. You're on the world over. What's your question for Ridley? Hi, Ridley. Uh, Raymond, um, I'm having trouble having... Uh, getting my son to read. He loves nonfiction, but I can't get him to grab onto fictional stories. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, oh. Yeah, well, this is very self serving, but um, <laughs> we hear from um, many, many hundreds of parents mm -hmm. who say that the first Kingdom Keepers book 
is what got their child reading. We, Dave Barry and I also used to get that with Peter and the Star Catchers. Yep. They're two very different stories. Mm -hmm. One is set in the yep. 1800s and is the origins of Peter Pan, mm -hmm. and The Kingdom Keepers is about five kids inside Disney World after dark. But for whatever reason, it, they're also used, Kingdom Keepers 1 is also used in institutions that work with aut autistic kids. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have, I, I know we don't have time for this, no, but no, no, I have an amazing story about a parent. Okay, tell me. Um, and, and that is I got a call one time, or I got an email one time from a um, woman who was going on a trip and wanted Dave's and my permission to take our book, Peter and the Star Catchers, with her because her son had gotten into reading just a few weeks earlier, and she had to leave on this long trip. Her name was Katie Coleman, and she was going to the International Space Station. Oh, my God. And she ended up taking the series there and reading the book from outer space to her son in Austin, Texas. Oh the, the The biggest compliment you could ever get in your life. Talk about And they the read all catchers. four books. So that was another case of a mother saying, my son's really into this book, and it's the only book I can get him to read. So you've yeah. got to find the right book. Yeah. Our daughter, Paige, was being handed all these princess books. She just wasn't a reader. Mm -hmm. She went with me to a bookstore one day. She found an action book, mm -hmm. and that started her. Pretty soon she was reading Lee Child when she was like nine years old. You know? <laughs> no, it's, I, I you mean, just let them do what they want to do. Yeah, we, have a, we have some tips on Story Ended about getting kids hooked on reading, yeah. and it's an important adventure. And one of the things you do, let them choose what they want to read. Even if it's a graphic novel at first, or it's something that might not be Mark Twain, oh, it can be a they'll find their way. box. Right. Yeah. They'll find and their way. And you have to give them, I always give kids the um, absolute right to abandon my book. You know, if you give me 50 pages and you don't like it, you shouldn't learn to dislike reading because you're stuck in a book. Yeah. Put that book aside and find, and find the one you do that'll get you more than 50 pages into it. Okay, Mary Lou, I think, is calling from Georgia. Yes. Mary Lou, you're on the world over. We could sing a Ridley song for Pearson. that. Mary Lou I'm from sorry, Pennsylvania. I'm... Go ahead, Mary Lou. Hi. Am I speaking with um, Oh, yes, Ridley Pearson? Speak, turn your volume down and talk to us. Yes, yes. you are. Oh, all right. I, I'm turning volume down, yes. Oh, thank no, you. People are on delay. This is yeah, what yeah, happens yeah. when you don't listen to me the first time, Mary Lou. Just listen to us on the phone, not on TV. It's always delayed. I live with this, like the people oh, on the space I, station, I, I should, you know? Yes, yes. Okay. Talk. Just talk the phone, now. Tell correct? us a question quickly. Yes. I'm with the phone. Okay, Mary Lou, I'm going to have to let you go. I love you, but <laughs> this is taking too much time. Go, Chris, get her question and let me know what it is. I have to get some questions out to you that we ask all of our oh, story-oriented authors. Um, all, all she wanted to know, Mary Lou wanted to know, what is the age group for your book? This is a middle grade book, but what is the it age is. group? It is. It's 8 to 80. Yep. What I didn't know when I started the Kingdom Keeper series was how many adult Disney fanatics there are who would love to know what it's like right. behind the scenes in the parks. And these books each go to a different Disney park, mm -hmm. and they show you the behind-the-scenes stuff that you just can't see any other way. Yeah. So yeah. Well, it's, I, it's taken on a huge adult readership, which no, is great. It is amazing. Half of middle grade and young adult books are read by people over 18. So yeah, adults yeah. are reading. That's, that's my statistic, too, is exactly. Do you, think, do you think it's a, a, a yearning for wonder, a sense of wonder? And It and, could be. I think it's also that we write, when we're writing middle school books, even different than young adult, is mm -hmm. they're, they're more PG. Mm -hmm. uh, they aren't R-rated books. Right. And, and a lot of us get tired of, you know, I write R-rated books for adults in right. that they're violent and crazy yeah. and tense. But we also like to just have great story. J.K. Rowling's who gave this all yeah. to us, you know, uh, just wonderful storytelling. Yeah. Uh, Rita, you have a yes. question for Ridley, and then I we have got, a few. We've got songs with Go all ahead, these Go ahead, Rita, what's names? your question? Ridley, my name is Rita Silvestri. I'm an 81-year-old grandmother, and I started writing when I was four or five years old, and I never did anything all my life. And finally, two or three years ago, I started to write. And I'm getting all kinds of good praises from the books that I'm putting out there. But now I've gotten this thing in my head where I would like to go from memoirs to maybe a novel of some sort. And I have it in my mind yeah. to write about my family and turn that into a novel. What do you suggest? Is it a good idea or should I stick with what I know? Mm. 
Well, I think um, you're on the right track in that when I, I volunteer teach occasionally, and I, the thing I start them with is memoir, and uh, because we can all write comfortably about memoir. It's about us. I, I don't think you're going to want to go to a novel from that because you're likely to make it too factual and be too held in the real story of your family. Mm. But you might have a wonderful character in your family or a story you've heard about one of your family members, and I'd go more that direction. Mm. Uh, I want to ask you a few questions before we run out of time, and then I'm going to do an after show with you for a few minutes if you'll stay around. Sure. Uh, your favorite children's book? Well, my, the book that transformed me was Harold and His Purple Crayon, which oh. is a very little children's yes. book. Now, why? But That's a picture book. It's a picture book where a young boy could take a crayon and he would paint on the wall and it came to life. Mm. And I had that kind of an imagination and it just spoke to me. And I thought, wow, a world that you can draw and it comes to life. And mm. by about 10 years old, I was writing worlds that came to life. So. Mm. I think it, it really changed me. Um, I read a lot of Rudyard Kipling as a kid because of the jungle stories and everything. Um, and as I got older, I got into Edgar Allan Poe and became the demented human I am today. So, <laughs> I know, see it all a, now. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. becoming clearer now, yeah. suddenly. Um, you write 10 hours a day. Yeah, how I do you 8 to 10, yeah. How do you stay there for 10 hours? I mean, I how can, can go... How can you leave? Oh. I can leave. I can find a thousand <laughs> distractions. Let me yeah. count the distractions. I mean, after four or five hours, I'm... Well, I take breaks, of course, all along the way. So I take, I take 15 or 30 minutes for lunch, and I get up and walk around the block and do things like that. But since I've taken on multiple projects, which mm -hmm. I thought was going to be a burden, it's turned out to be a blessing because you get so... When you write one book, at least when I write one book, I get so hung up in that book. Yeah, you're right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you can't I'm living it. it. I'm breathing it. When you're writing two or three... You, you have to leave that one completely behind, and you have to um, Enter you know, a new em world. embody new characters and a new world. And you, you fi I find it exciting. I can't wait to get to that next one. And by the time that I've ended the day, the, my mysteries and thrillers, which I write first, mm -hmm. I'm dying to get back to them. So it's been a real inspiration for me. Wow. If you could name three books that everyone must read oh my. for young people, what are the books that for young people that, that not only that touch not only touched your life but the lessons you derived well from. I would have to go a little older than young okay I mean I read the Hardy Boys mm -hmm. and and I read uh, I read the landmark books and I'm oh, sure, sure none of those things are still around well, as, as a younger so. kid but um, you know I think that the the to kill a mockingbird Harper Lee's to kill a mockingbird I, all, I read it almost every year. I've probably read it 25 times, something like that. Why? I taught it when I taught. It's the perfect book. Mm -hmm. It has um, social issues, moral issues, wonderful sense of family, yeah. that terrifying Boo Radley house down mm -hmm. the street. Uh, it, it's, it's epic in, it's not epic in its scope, it's epic in its content. And mm -hmm. if there's one book when you get, and what I don't like is that people read this in like seventh and eighth grade. You can read this book, it's fine to read it then for your school, mm -hmm. read it again when you're 18 or 20, because it's unbelievable. Yeah. What do you think of the new one, the go, go Set a Watch? I've, I've read a little bit of it, and it's fascinating, yeah. but I haven't gotten very far in it, to tell mm -hmm. you the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell me about The Return. This is this book, The Kingdom it's Keepers had story. grown up, yeah. uh, graduated yep. high school. Yep. Now Wayne, who's the Imagineer, kind of the Merlin character, yep. uh, yeah, he's, he is. he's dying. They go back in time. Tell me about this. I, I wrote seven books, and I am that architect you asked about, so I had planned the entire series, and it, I tied it off at the end. And then my publisher, of course, came and said, could you write some more Kingdom Keepers books? I said, I tied it off. You know? <laughs> it's done. It's done. And they said, is there any other idea you could I said, oh, I have a lot of ideas, but none are lighting me on fire. And I had a 10-year-old boy email me and say, what if Finn Whitman, and he didn't know I was even thinking about other ideas. He said, what if Finn Whitman got on King Arthur Carousel? And it went around and around. And he started feeling a little dizzy, and he started feeling a little woozy. And he stepped off the carousel, 
and it wasn't where he got off. Mm. But it was 1955 and the opening of the parks. Oh my! God. And I went, well, there's the next series. So there it is. It's a three-book series, and the second one comes out at the end of March. Fascinating, Ridley Pearson. Thank you so much thank for being you here for having and me. for storyenting well, all of us. You, your, your books <laughs> are you. wonderful. The latest installment of the Kingdom Keepers series, the return book, one Disneyland's by Ridley is available now at bookstores everywhere and online. And be sure to follow my new literacy initiative, Storyented. Yes. You can find us at storyented.com. Twitter is at Storyented. <laughs>